Hi, this is Lily DeHoyas Anderson, and you're listening to Choosing Glory. This is part two of Ether chapters six through 11. As I said, a lot of kings come and go, and the kingdom is divided very quickly here amongst the Jaredites, although they were warned that having kings would lead them into captivity, and it surely does. But the bigger problem is that they become unrighteous, and they start being idolatrous again. Before we get too much further with that, though, another little current event that you may or may not have heard about, but this is another sign of the times moment, and it's not a new wave of news because this has to do with the growing anti-Semitism in the world. And that is tragic to see. I don't know if you got a chance to Those of you who are Patreon subscribers, and thank you from the bottom of my heart for those of you who are able to subscribe on Patreon. It makes all the difference to the continuation of this work. I really am grateful and invite any of you to join us. The link below this video or the audio podcast can take you to the subscription page. At any rate, this happened in Amsterdam just a couple of days ago, so early November, there was a soccer match between the local team and the Israeli soccer team. Of course, they call it football over there, right? And American football is different, but we usually refer to it in America as soccer. So many Israeli citizens had gone that were fans to attend the match in Amsterdam. And apparently, and it was pretty organized, so This seems to have been planned that there were anti-Jewish groups, mostly Muslim immigrants or first generation of immigrants to the Netherlands that were from Muslim countries who were waiting at the end of the soccer game at all the exits of the stadium and gave chase to those who were identifiable as Israelis from their, you know, gear or any of the things that, you know, um, they were wearing a yarmulke or any kind of uh, symbol of Judaism. And this is a terrible story. I'm really sorry to report it, but men, women, and children, like families, were chased through the streets. Some were beaten and kicked, and a few were thrown into the freezing canals. Amsterdam has canals all through the city and it's built around them. But anyway, one man was run down by a car very deliberately. Five were hospitalized, 20 to 30 suffered light injuries. 62 suspects were arrested. But at the time of the article that I read, one of the articles that I read, I saw a few, there were only 10 still in custody. I don't know what that means exactly, if they're going to charge all of them or just these 10. Anyway, I don't know that detail. Apparently, Israel had received some intelligence of this planned attack and warned the officials in Amsterdam, but it still took 30 minutes for the local police to respond. So those Israeli citizens were on their own for a while. And can you imagine? Like, this is actually a pogrom. Like, remember that word, P-O-G-R-O-M, that referred to the times before World War II? where Jews were, the villages where Jews lived were attacked. I mean, people, Gentile groups would come who were anti-Jew, and they would come and they would break the shop windows, steal things, destroy things, beat people up, you know, rouse them around and, yeah, chase and kick them around a little bit. And that was something that happened periodically, particularly in Eastern Europe. Russia, it happened. So some... Jews had been evicted before from their homes or whatever because of that anti-Jewish sentiment, but others stayed. There was a very famous one that is seen as one of the harbingers of World War II, and it's called Kristallnacht, which is a German word that is sort of night of the broken glass. And it was a huge pogrom that happened that many were hurt. And so These are not good things to see returning. You know, it's 
again, it's sort of astonishing to me since I grew up and I was pretty young when I became aware of this stuff because of books that I read or whatever, but I, I just still was growing up at a time where there was a lot of universal guilt for allowing the Holocaust to happen in the Western countries. It was seen as like, how did, how did we let this go on where there really was this attempted genocide of a people because of their race and religion and it seemed that certainly some countries had determined, not just the Jews themselves, but that this would never happen again. And it's happening again, as prophesied. It just was quicker than I thought it could be, because when the Lord tells us these prophecies, he doesn't necessarily give us a timetable to all of it. And I thought it would take longer for that reversal to happen. It has not. It has come sort of stunningly fast in these last Years. I mean, there were some gradual indicators of growing anti-Semitism, but I didn't think America was going to be that way for a long time, and it is, at least parts of this country. And it's horrible that this is happening again. Now, Amsterdam has a pretty tragic history when it comes to the Jews. In fact, Chris and I actually were able to travel there two years ago, a little more than two years ago now, and we had never been before. And we did one of the tours that we did was to see kind of the history of the Jewish population of Amsterdam in other countries in Europe as well, but certainly all over the Netherlands and in Amsterdam, there are a lot of them. There are, they have these kind of brass medallions that are in the cobblestone sidewalks or placed sometimes in other ways. Some of them are by the canal where they have homes on either side and you can see where Jewish families were deported from and they'll list their names and it's a memoriam to the tragedy of letting these people be deported to the camps from their homes. They were citizens there in Amsterdam. So we went on a tour. And of course, just anytime you're walking around, you see those medallions in the streets that are in front of a business or in front of a home where Jews lived in as citizens of the Netherlands there in Amsterdam and were taken to the camps and lost their lives. So it's a tragedy that they try to keep relevant. And here we are. Here we are where it's happening again. And there was shame expressed by some of the leaders of the Netherlands. But it it happened. And it's hard to imagine that it happened. Well, not that hard anymore. Prophecy is being fulfilled that nations are turning against Israel. Not everybody, but that these things are happening in almost every nation that you never thought it would. There is a big Holocaust memorial there in Amsterdam too. And you can see Anne Frank's name and her family's carved into bricks that are part of the memorial. It's a beautiful little place, solemn. And their names of all the Jews that were killed. Let me give you a couple of numbers. Pre-World War II, the Jewish population in Amsterdam was about 75,000, but grew to above 80,000, it's estimated, in 1941 because of people who were escaping the Nazis and thought Amsterdam would be safe. So the population had grown even until 1941, but it was about just under 10% of the city's total population, or not quite 10%. The Nazis killed around 75% of the Jews that were living in Amsterdam. So now that number more or less, is estimated to be 15,000. So they had over 80,000 in the Jewish population of Amsterdam. And now, all these years after the war, it's around 15,000. So there is a Jewish community there. But this, this is why the state of Israel exists. Because after the war, so many Jews got tired of saying, every Passover next year in Jerusalem and decided it has to be this year. We need to have a Jewish state that we can defend ourselves. And now that is being challenged, of course, by what's going on in so many countries that are saying they're not entitled to that state, that they stole the land. Well, it is their homeland. And tell me where else they have ever been consistently protected over time. And the United States was quite a haven and still is. But again, now we've got people in the United States that, I mean, there are some synagogues that are being attacked. Anti-Semitism has grown and we've seen it grow on college campuses with all these 
demonstrations, college kids who seem not to understand the history. I hope you'll tell your children. I did look up a few of things because I remembered from our trip there and the tour that we took to see the Anne Frank home and so on. It's a tragic story, and I hope you're very familiar with it and that your children become familiar with those things. It's valuable, as Santayana said so many years ago, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. Let's not be a part of that ourselves. Anyway, the trams in Amsterdam are still run by the same company that ran before the war and during the war. It's GVB. I don't know what that stands for, but it's still the city's public transport company. And it took the Jews to the trains that took them to the death camps. And it was discovered not that many years ago that they actually cooperated fully with the Nazis and were paid to deport the Jews in that way from funds that were confiscated from the Jews that were being deported. So the Jews ended up paying with their own confiscated wealth for their transport to the death camps. I mean, the irony is huge. Just another pitch for the history. I don't know why they stopped doing this, except that, I mean, I... It's not about trying to traumatize our kids, but they used to show us in school. Now I'm getting pretty old, but I think it was in junior high. So I only did seventh and eighth grade in Indiana, and I know it was there in Indiana. I don't think it would have been sixth grade, but I think in seventh or eighth grade, they showed us film, black and white film that was taken by allied soldiers with permission to record this when they went into the death camps and freed the surviving Jews. But it showed heaped up corpses that were like skeletons. And we saw that in the videos. And it showed some of the survivors that didn't have enough meat on their bones that it looked like they could even be alive. They were truly skeletal. And brothers and sisters, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget it. And I didn't feel traumatized. I did feel horror. And we need to feel horror at those things. At age-appropriate levels, our children need to know of the evil that exists so that they can hate it and shun it. Not the sinners. We don't hate sinners, but we need to hate the sins. We need to feel terrible for the sinners who get so dead to the light that they do those things at various levels. But so many people were involved with those things, and I'm grateful that God is the judge. I would never want to try to sort out all of that. Some of it is pretty obvious. Other stuff obviously will have to be adjudicated by the great God who knows all these things and will get it exactly right. But wow, our children need to know history. I should have mentioned at the end of chapter 7 that prophets come among the people because they become wicked. This is verse 23. Just to finish up chapter 7, people revile against them and mock them. Shul, the king, who is a righteous guy, makes it illegal to do that. So he lets the prophets be unmolested as they try to re preach repentance to the people. And the people do repent and they are spared. So again, we're going to go through these cycles with the Jaredites. Chapter 8. Anyway, there's a younger son of Shul whose name is Omer, and his son Jared, named for ancestor apparently, gets half the kingdom, battles his father, puts his father in prison, and has some brothers who get angry at him for doing that, and they come to rescue their father, and they're about to kill their brother Jared, who is the one who started all the trouble, but he pleads for his life, so they spare it, which may have been a mistake, because... Jared becomes very sorrowful in verse 7, kind of depressed, and his daughter sees his sorrow in verses 8 and 9. <laughs> this, is, this is a terrible story. She's exceedingly expert in verse 8, and she sees the sorrows of her father and thought to devise a plan whereby she could redeem the kingdom unto her father. I'll fix this. So she knows of secret combinations. And it says that she learned that because she had read the record which our fathers brought across the great deep. So this is what her scripture study yielded her, was that she knows about these secret combinations and says, let's try that. So she talks her father into getting Akish, a guy named Akish, 
to get some buddies and enter into a secret oath. And so go get him. And I'm a fair and I'll dance before him. This is verse 10. And I'll please him and he'll want to marry me. And so say, okay, if you bring me the head of my father, the king, and the king, Omer, who's the good guy, is a friend of Akish. So Akish can get close to him, right? So anyway, Akish is happy to want to marry the daughter there who dances in front of him. And so he tells Jared he'd like to marry her. And he says, okay, if you bring me the head of my father. And Akish goes and says, hmm, okay. And they start the secret oaths again. And the secret combinations come back once again. And of course, they don't even need the records. Because remember, the source of all these things is Satan. And he reveals them again if people want them. So he's ever ready to take people even into darker places. And look at all this. Verse 17, it was the daughter of Jared who put it in his heart to search up these things. And so Achish administers the oath, and now they have secret combinations. Verse 18, verse 19, the Lord worketh not in secret combinations. And we have Moroni's strong warnings. Now think, because honestly, the Gideon robbers have been around now again for a while. And this has been prophesied, right? We know this. Even in our word of wisdom, it talks about how there will be conspiring men in the last days when it even comes to health. And have we not seen it with the tobacco executives who tried to hide the information about the connection with tobacco and cancer? And now we're hearing a lot of things about big pharma and who funded the studies about various health issues and how embedded some of the food companies are with special interests and agriculture is. And so they give us terrible recommendations for our health and spray our crops with Roundup, glyphosate, right? Isn't that glyphosate, I think? That's Roundup, and it brings forth a little bit more of a yield as it's dying, and so they get richer while people are ingesting things that are not good for us. Anyway, we have things going on in the United States in our food ingredients that are banned, even in Canada, let alone in Europe, and so our food is lousy. And you think, like, okay, why is that? Conspiring men. Now, Gaddy and robbers are back, brothers and sisters. I hope that's not a stretch for anybody. And then certainly government always has people who do the, become corrupt and sell out. And I think that can be easily on both sides, every side. I, I'm not saying everybody's corrupt, but I don't know everybody. That's a line from a wonderful movie, <laughs> One, Two, Three with Jimmy Cagney. I don't think it's streaming, but wow, that's a fun movie if you ever get a chance to get the DVD and have that ancient technology. Okay. Moroni makes this warning. It hath been made known unto me that they are among the people. He's not going to write down the oath because they're already out there and they are had among the Lamanites and they have caused the destruction of this people of whom I am now speaking, the Jaredites, and it destroyed the Nephites too, right? And that's what he says, the destruction of the people of Nephi. And whatsoever nation shall uphold such secret combinations to get power and gain until they spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. For the Lord will not suffer that the blood of his saints, which shall be shed by them, shall always cry to him from the ground for vengeance upon them, and yet avenge them not. Like, he lets that go on for a while, but not forever. Judgment comes. Not as soon as some of us want it, but then we better clean up our own act too, because judgment will come to us. So that's what we should concern ourselves with, is tending our own garden. And all this is about power, gain, and wealth, right? So, verse 24, when ye shall see these things come among you, awake to a sense of your awful situation because of this secret combination which shall be among you, or woe be unto it because of the blood of them who have been slain. Verse 25, whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries, and it bringeth to pass the destruction of all people, for it is built up by the devil, who is the father of all lies. And he's the one who inspired people to commit murder from the beginning puts murder in the hearts of men, etc., etc. So that's the end of chapter 8. Pretty sad. Now, I do want to say something about secrets. As a counselor, I talk to a lot of people about how dangerous secrets are. I'm not talking about, you know, a surprise party. I'm not talking about, you know, fun little surprises that we might keep. I'm talking about not disclosing all the truth to people who deserve it. And that can be our partners. Didn't we see in this election even ads to lie to your spouse about who you voted for? Like, 
that's pretty bad, brothers and sisters. Like, that ruins relationships to not be honest with people, not just talk it out. And, you know, if you disagree, agree to disagree, but not lie about it, not deceive. Who is the father of all lies? So secrets and lies, I mean, it can be so toxic. And sometimes you'll see these generational secrets that happen in families. And what's so really ironic is that they're usually open secrets. Some people know about it anyway. Maybe not everybody, but that is divisive too. So anyway, I was just looked up a comment on this from a mental health professional who said one of the most toxic problems confronting many families is the existence of secrets that prevent open communication and ultimately lead to serious health and mental health problems for family members. In the end, some families are unable to maintain their cohesiveness because of family secrets. I've seen that, brothers and sisters. It's awful. Secrets lead to lies and secrets and lies have serious consequences. I mean, it's so obvious when you think about it. Tell your children the truth. They should know. Now, I'm not saying that we disclose everything to children. There are some things that we have to be very careful about age-appropriate disclosure, right? Not because we're telling them lies, but because they have a right to mature in innocence for a time. Now, the world is taking that innocence from them, so hopefully we talk to our children before the world gets to them about things so that they'll know they can come to us with their questions and we have open conversations about things like sexual intimacy and biological sex and how people are attacking that and trying to turn it into this whole spectrum of gender and and how that is not God's way. And it doesn't condemn the people who might be confused, but it does condemn the ideology that would tell children that God didn't make them a boy or a girl. And when they are so, so vulnerable, talks them into things that really are harmful and can cost them so much at a time when we are supposed to be protecting them as their parents and as society. And actually, this is you know such a horrible thing that has been going on where some states are calling themselves sanctuary states so that children can go without the permission of their parents to get these really, really serious alterations done to their development through either chemical administration of hormones and all that and eventually surgeries I mean and taking custody away from parents or I've seen stories about disputes in divorce where one parent wants to affirm the transition and the other parent doesn't and how anyway that can even affect your access and people have lost custody of their children in some states I mean this is serious stuff brothers and sisters Satan is raging our children do need protection and truth sets us free. So again, it's tricky now that our kids are being exposed to things so young. Some things that we would rather not have to talk to our children about until they're older. Let's be very prayerful. Let's seek the revelation that we are entitled to over our stewardship and consult with people that you trust for help with this. But brothers and sisters, we need to protect our children as much as we can. And ultimately, it is not only truth, but knowing that they can come to us and receive truth, that we don't hold back things from them that they need to know. Sometimes we think we're protecting them. And what happens, I've seen it in counseling, is that then the kids don't know who to trust. Because even if you were trying to protect them, but they didn't get the truth from you, then later they're like, well, how do I know I'll get the truth this time? Because you didn't tell me this. And I could see part of it with my own eyes or I was sensing something that was amiss and nobody would answer my questions. We don't want that. We don't want that. So we need to make sure that secrets, which are so connected to lies and if not intended to be lies, can be seen as lies by those who should be able to trust us, can do so much damage. We need to embrace truth. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but remember from DNC 93, right? Truth is knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come. And whatsoever is more or less than this is the spirit of the wicked one who was a liar from the beginning. The spirit of truth is of God. May we align ourselves always with truth. If we have a habit of exaggerating or, you know, spinning white lies or whatever, let's get over it completely. We need to be careful. We're human, and I realize that, but brothers and sisters, we can do this. This is a part of living celestially, is to embrace truth and not error, and to not speak anything that isn't true. 
as it says, our thoughts and our words will condemn us. And out of the abundance of the heart, it says in the New Testament, the mouth speaketh. Brothers and sisters, let us be truth tellers. Let us not be ashamed of the truth. Let us not be afraid of the truth. If we have a sensitive situation, we can pray and consult and find ways. We can practice the language of it in writing. I've told a lot of people that over the years. Go write it down, how you would say this to your child or to your spouse or whomever you need to talk to. Write it down so that you can organize your thoughts and you can find the articulation for it. But tell the truth. That I mean, it sounds so obvious, right? <laughs> so we're going to come back to this. But Elder Bednar gave a recent fireside. I think it was November 3rd. No, actually, this was a fireside from 2009 called Things As They Really Are. Excellent about media and online stuff that can really deceive. And he was talking to youth. It was a BYU fireside, but he recently did the Worldwide Devotional, November 3rd. That's the one. 2024 called Things As They Really Are 2.0. Maybe some of you have seen it. He actually, before that Worldwide Devotional, invited publicly or, you know, to the church, all those students who were going to hear that, young people that was intended for, but it's good for all of us, right? But he actually invited us to review his fireside speech from 2009, Things As They Really Are, and then he went further in Things As They Really Are as an updated version, 2.0. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit, but let's finish up here. Moroni's warning is for us. He saw our day. You think he's talking about this just for the Jaredites? No, it's for us today. We should be aware of what is going on and rebuke it and make sure our children have the tools they need to cling to truth. And ultimately, that's the spirit. We've been talking about that all year and especially recently. Okay, chapter nine. Akish actually does overthrow the kingdom of Omer. But Omer is warned by the Lord because he's a good guy to depart. So anyway, this is horrible what happens. Jared is appointed the king, but then his son-in-law, who marries the daughter now, right? So this is Achish, who started the secret combinations again at the, you know, the idea of the woman who becomes his wife. And they kill Jared. So she starts this whole thing in process to cheer up her dad. And now her new husband kills her dad. And not only that, but he's jealous of their son, whom, because of the pattern of the people, might overthrow him. That seems to be happening regularly. So he imprisons and basically starves their son to death. Is, is this what, you know, look, look what you do when you start to deal in this kind of thing. She turns, I mean, can you imagine? Your dad is depressed. Oh, here's a thought. Let's create a secret combination and I'll seduce this guy so that uh, he'll kill your dad, my grandfather. So you can have the kingdom. And then, of course, her dad gets caught up by that and killed. And her son gets killed. I mean, come on. What do you think you're playing with when you go this direction, right? What do any of us think when we, we think we can... What does it say in the book of Proverbs? Can a man walk on hot coals and not get burned? You can't mess with that kind of stuff and think, oh, I can come out clean. I'll be fine. And my family will be just fine. We'll just do it, you know, when it's convenient. Anyway, cling to the good, brothers and sisters. Cling to the rod of iron. Lots of mists of darkness around these days. Okay, so anyway it goes on it's ugly another son gets angry that the, his brother was killed and so he goes and joins omer's kingdom because now they're divided kingdoms again and whatever it goes on and on and on but eventually people destroy each other in the kingdom of akish and the survivors go over and join omer so actually for a little while they're one kingdom and righteous people flourish for a while under king emer and there are some details here that have become a stumbling block for people because anything can become a stumbling block if we don't have immediate answers right now because we're so patient that there are horses and elephants and other animals we've never heard of that were useful to these people. So a lot of people have, and we've talked about how there actually were ancient American horses that they're finding now that whatever, but for a long time they didn't. And people use that as an excuse to diss the Book of Mormon and like, okay, whatever. You really want to find a stumbling block, you'll find a stumbling block. But where is the trust? 
And where's the patience? No, I want it right now. I want all the answers right now. And if I don't get them, I'm not going to trust this God who has a pretty dang good track record, brothers and sisters. Like, maybe, maybe we could be a little patient and let him reveal to us when it's ready. In the meantime, see, there's a test of our faith instead of like, just like, well, if I don't know the answer to this right now, I'm out. Ooh, foolishness. So anyway, there's a successful, righteous, and prosperous reign of Emer, which is getting to be more and more unusual for this people. But his son, Coriantum, actually, also sees peace in the land and saw the son of righteousness. This is chapter 9, verse 21, which is quite something. So this is, I guess it's verse 22, where it says that he saw peace in the land and he even saw the son of righteousness. So he was probably worthy enough of getting his calling election made sure and receiving the second comforter. That's pretty amazing. And dies in peace. And then we go on. Now Heth somewhere down the line embraces the secrets again. The Eddie and robbers are back. More dethroning. People don't believe. So then there's a big famine because there's no rain for a long time. So they call it a great dearth. Not only that, poisonous serpents come. So <laughs> I mean, God is trying to get the attention of these people because they could still be saved, right? Because they try to go to the land of Zarahemla because the game is all being destroyed. They've eaten up everything they can and they can't grow anything because there's no rain. But the poisonous serpents have inhabited this narrow neck of land so they can't get to the region which later becomes Zarahemla. Moroni knows that. I guess he's seen maps or something. But anyway, the poisonous serpents block the way. So... They're about to perish. And what do they do in verse 34? They repent. The cycle begins again. And so God, in his mercy, after they humble themselves, he sends rain. Chapter 10, same old, same old. We have the repetition. We have an interesting little detail here about one of the kings. Who is this one? I don't know. What's his name? Morianton, I guess. And he does establish himself king over all the land. So I guess they're united again. And he eased the burden of the people. So they liked him. And he did do justice unto the people, but not unto himself because of his many whoredoms. Isn't that interesting? Because some people <laughs> think that, I don't know. Anyway, think of some of our current players in the political scene who might do justice to the people, but don't do justice to themselves. They don't maybe clean up their act completely to be worthy fully before God, but they deal justly with the people. It's interesting, right? And we saw that occasionally in the Old Testament, I think, with some of the kings in those two kingdoms before they're destroyed. I think it's wonderful that that's mentioned because it helps us see that, like, you know, there are layers, right? Some people may do more justly by the people than they do toward themselves. So they don't please God, but they please God in the way they administer the affairs of the kingdom. And that was the case with this king. So they become prosperous and rich again. Shocker. This is the cycle repeating. And the serpents are ultimately able to be destroyed. So they do spread out south. And now they're in an area close to where Zarahemla is going to be. Not exactly the same spot because we're going to See what happens to the end of the Jaredites and Zarahemla is built in land that's not covered with bones. But anyway, they're very industrious. Chapter 10, verse 22. And never a more blessed people. Now we've heard that before. So it doesn't mean that they were more blessed than anybody else. It says that there wasn't anybody that was ever blessed more. So from time to time, when people worship the God of the land who is Jesus Christ, they can attain this descriptor that there was never anyone more blessed because God is able to prosper and protect. And Moroni adds, verse 28, they were in a land that was choice above all lands for the Lord had spoken it. So the kingdom that is taken away from that king and there began to be robbers in the land, verse 33, and the old plans come back, chapter 11, prophets come again and prophesy of the destruction of this people so there's a lot of commotion, a great war in all the land, but people are putting the prophets to death. And what did they prophesy in verse 6? And this is exactly what happens to the Jaredites, that there would be a curse 
and also upon this people that there should be a great destruction such as one as never had been upon the face of the earth and their bones should become as heaps of earth upon the face of the land except they should repent of their wickedness. Now, again, when the record of ether is found, it is in a land covered with bones and it is the people of Limhi, Zarahemla, somewhere in the north, Zenith takes his people south to inhabit the land of their first inheritance where Nephi and Lehi landed and first built a temple. But then the Nephites keep moving north, find the Mulekite city of Zarahemla. But Zenith takes a group of people back down there and they think that they make peace with the Lamanites, but it's really just a ruse so that the Lamanites can eventually take them into captivity and get taxes from them, get serfdom from them. So anyway, Limhi starts to fight wars with them. And then Noah reigns in unrighteousness, and his son Limhi then reigns as a captive king. And Limhi is a good guy, and he sends a scouting team to try to find Zarahemla to see if they can get help from their brethren to liberate them. But he doesn't know if they're even existing anymore. Who knows what happens? People disappear in this land if they don't worship God. So here's Zarahemla. Here's Limhi down here in the south somewhere as a captive king under the Lamanites. And he sends that scouting party out, but they end up in this land of bones and find that record that Moroni is condensing and making into the Book of Ether. So they bring the plates back with them to Limhi. He can't read them. They're in the Adamic language. And when Zarahemla sends out Ammon and his search party to see what happened to the people of Zenith, because some of their relatives and friends are wondering, then they find King Limhi. And one of his early questions is, does anybody up there know how to translate these plates? Because they were in this land with all these bones. Just like the prophets prophesied. Why do we bet against them? Anyway, they begin to repent for a while. So there's mercy. But then they harden their hearts. Verse 13. And the prophets mourned and withdrew. Because God will not contend. I command and men obey not. I revoke and they receive not the blessing. I quote, DNC 58 regularly, but that is a huge principle for God. He's not going to argue us into the kingdom. He's not going to contend with us. He lays out a bounty for us, a feast for us, but only if we choose to partake do we get the benefits. So now finally we're down to this King Coriantor who is in captivity all his days, I think. And then many prophets again, they cry repentance. Coriantor has a son named Ether, who writes this record. So we're set up now for the last few chapters of the record of the Jaredites. Now, let's just talk for a few moments about that speech that Elder Bednar gave, because I think it goes well with this resurgence of the secret combinations, as he talks about the importance of things as they really are. And this is his 2.0 version that I'm quoting from. He talks specifically about AI, which is pretty interesting. And of course, the whole speech is good. It's You can see it on video or you can read it. It's now available in print online anyway. Now, I'm jumping around in the speech a little bit, okay? So I'm not saying that this is necessarily the order in which he addresses these subjects, but he does talk specifically about AI, which is certainly a worthy update to his voice of warning about technology. Consider the following perilous possibility. I didn't know about this, so I was kind of on the innocent side of this. I mentioned it to my daughter, Caitlin, and she said, oh, yeah, uh, apparently there are AI-developed companions. I mean, come on. We've had pornography galore, sex trafficking, and child trafficking, which is such an abomination, has become rampant again. Certainly the open border facilitated that. The cartels have been trafficking people at higher levels than ever before because of the policies there. So, so much evil has come, but that's not enough. Now, AI companions, a girlfriend or a boyfriend can be meticulously designed to offer engaging and addictive experiences, appealing to a wide range of emotional and social needs. Of course, they don't stop there. And they go into areas of sexuality as well. And there's just no limit to the evil that can be done. Now, he makes it very clear he's not condemning AI. As with everything, it can be a tool and it can be a weapon of destruction. That's always been the case with technology. And we've heard that from our leaders forever. 
But this is what Elder Bednar warns. This personalization, meaning you get to carve up this companion any way you want, creates a sense of connection and understanding. Remember, Satan is the master counterfeiter. He goes after the gold. What is the pinnacle of life that will be granted to everybody who has this righteous desire? And that is to marry. God placed that desire in us for men to find a woman and woman to find a man with whom we can share and become emotionally intimate and spiritually intimate and physically intimate. The whole package is designed to be for men and women to legally and lawfully and hopefully according to God's law, seal in the temple, become a unit and create a family and have this, if we work at it, eternal relationship, which is the pinnacle of human development and joy. But no, here Satan goes after it with AI to create a sense of connection and understanding, making interactions with these virtual companions highly appealing because you get to script it, basically. The allure is further heightened by their 24-7 availability and the absence of the complexities, you think, often found in authentic human relationships. Oh, that's very, very discreetly said here, isn't it? Uh, very diplomatic. The complexities often found in authentic human relationships. Because not only is this the pinnacle relationship of men and women, it's it's also the most challenging. What a surprise. Things are worth what you pay for them. And it takes a lot to overcome the complexities of human relationships with righteousness and receiving revelation, being willing to change and put all our stuff on the altar that we need to get rid of, the Babylon baggage and the old hang-ups and the human weaknesses and frailties and become worthy of an eternal marriage, which is a big deal, brothers and sisters, because it's just the highest level of the celestial kingdom. Going on, from remembering important dates to responding to a consistently understanding manner, these AI companions are programmed to fulfill idealized, that's the counterfeit, companionship roles, making them especially addictive and distorting perceptions of things as they really are in human relationships. Furthermore, Virtual companions specifically designed to appeal to and evolve with a person's emotional needs may wreak havoc in previously safe relationships. So even if you have a safe relationship and you do this on the side, you're basically cheating. And he talks about that. Oh, and he uses the word counterfeit emotional intimacy may displace real life emotional intimacy. It will. And that is what binds us together. So I'm going to put some of the rest of this on Patreon and talk about it a little bit more. But it's a good speech if you want to go look it up, brothers and sisters. It is worth talking to our children about this stuff. It is worth it. They are in an interesting and challenging world. And yes, there are great possibilities. He mentions how he didn't use AI to write the speech. He used it to critique the speech. And then he made a few adjustments. So he said, you know, these are great tools if we don't use them to get out of the work that God wants us to do, because he mentions again specifically how many, or he kind of queries how many sacrament meeting talks this Sunday will be given by AI, or given by people, but written by AI, and so something like that. I don't remember exactly what, but he's saying that that doesn't give us the growth and the development that actually putting those ideas together and writing our own speeches and lessons, etc., would do. So I'm way behind the times. I have not used chat. GPT or whatever other AI is out there. <laughs> and, and I'm sure I need to learn about that if I ever get back to writing, which I hope to do, brothers and sisters. And thank you for the encouragement of some of you who have reached out and encouraged me to keep, keep moving forward with the writing. I'm dealing with my health energy issues still, and it has been a real challenge, but I trust that in time, the Lord will direct me in whatever way he wants that to go. So I'm being prayerful about it. Brothers and sisters, we can do it even in an AI world. We can, as President Nelson has repeatedly encouraged us, find our way to a fullness of the companionship of the Holy Ghost. And he has told us we will not spiritually survive without it. Brothers and sisters, that is the path towards sanctification. That's choosing glory, learning to live more celestial. In my own journey, brothers and sisters, I have found how tightly I cling to some great terrestrial values and principles. I'll share more about this later, but it has been illuminating to me 
because they are good ways and the terrestrial is a good place, but it's, there's more and the celestial is added upon the terrestrial. And I have been giving a lot of thought to how I can not let go of the good, but depend more on the Holy Ghost than on sound reasoning. <laughs> Does that make sense? We'll talk more about this later. I want to choose the celestial. I want to choose the highest realm of glory that God offers his children. I know so many of you are right there with me and line upon line, precept upon precept. I'm trying to be patient in the journey and I'm getting better at that. It's always a bit of a challenge when we're hurting or going through hard things, but that is the case for pretty much everybody right now in the last of the last days. We all have a burden. May we bear it in patience and in progress. May we let the Lord do his alchemy with us and change our lead to gold, gospel gold, brothers and sisters, Zion gold. We can do it. As ever, thanks to my husband, Chris Anderson, and Doug Larson of Point Digital. Take care.